Okay, so in this video, I'll be solving example 6.1, where we'll look at leakage flow past a piston. And so this example goes along with video number 16. And so we're looking here at an internal laminar flow bounded between plates. Leakage flow past a piston. You've got a hydraulic system that operates at a gauge pressure of 20 MPa and 55 degrees Celsius. We're using um, SAE 10W oil, and it's saying our control valve between these two reservoirs consists of a piston 25 millimeters in diameter fitted to a cylinder with a mean radial clearance of 0.005 millimeters. Determine the leakage flow rate if the gauge pressure on the low pressure side of the pistons one megapascals and pistons 15 millimeters long. Okay, so we've got our figure here labeled with our two pressures, right? We've got our gap length shown there. So this is something I noticed as well from grading exams in the past and looking over questions in office hours, there weren't a lot of figures drawn. And anytime I'm solving these questions, I always sketch out a figure. I strongly encourage you to do this. I'm gonna sketch out one here just so it's really clear like what we're looking at. So if we imagine taking this system, looking from the top, sort of slicing it here and then peeling that out. I'll draw this in 3D so we have an example of this. So you stretch that out right? And then this distance here that we've just flattened out that right there, that's what we mean by L, right? So this is L stretched out and flattened out really nicely there. Now we've got our gap here, right? And that's basically the same as what's shown here. So from just turned on its side, right? So that's our gap length A. And then in this direction, we're going to have that L equals 15 millimeters flowing that way. And so that L is going to be the perimeter distance there. So that's like pi D or 2 pi R. Okay, so that's how we sort of stretch thing, this thing out and get it to be this flow between parallel plates. Now, determine the leakage flow rate if we have these two pressures given in these two reservoirs. So leakage flow rate, what, what is leakage flow rate asking us for? So that's asking us for the flow rate. It's literally saying, what's the flow rate? We have already calculated, we've already figured out the analytical solution to this. So we can actually just go ahead and sub in, we'll say governing equation. We figured out this expression in video 16. So we know our Q over L, a cubed delta P over 12 mu L. I'm just copying that directly from video 16 from what we already derived. We do want to pause and reflect for a second here just to make sure this is valid. So if we look at this system, the gap is small, but we're going to have to remember, we're going to have to check the Reynolds number after we solve this problem. Okay, so we'll deal with all those assumptions later. We'll just make them for now and assume they're fine. Um, what else? Steady. It had to be steady, right? So there's no indication that this changes in time fully developed, we can just get a quick idea. We want to make sure that the length this fluid flows. So that capital L there here, if we compare that to the gap size, 15 over 0 0.005, that's 3000. So it, we saw the example done earlier for a pipe, so an enclosed cylinder, and we saw that it took you know, 100 diameters for us to be out of the um, entrance length. In this case, we have a flow length distance, 15 millimeters, that's 3000 times the gap size. So it's a very good approximation to say that regardless of how long that entrance length region is, this flow will be totally dominated by fully developed flow. And again, that's an approximation, right? We're just, we know it's not exact. There is going to be a tiny entrance length, but it's just because this thing is so long relative to its gap size, it's just probably going to be negligible in how it influences our total flow. So that's kind of like a practical way we, we would look at and apply something like the fully developed assumption there. Okay, otherwise I've sketched it all out. So I'm going to scroll down and just sub in now. Um, that's really just <laughs> plug and chug now. So I'll rearrange for Q and sub in that L equals pi D. So we'll put the pi D on the top there. A cubed delta P over 12 mu L. We know all of that. So we're even given the temperature the oil's at. So we just go to a table. We can get mu for the oil. 
I'll just scribble in what that is here so we don't get confused. 0 0.01 meat kilograms per meter second. And then I'll plug it all in. So that's Q. If we're careful, we can keep our units and double check these later. So our diameter was given in millimeters. So let's go ahead and sub that in. 25 millimeters. 0 0.005 cubed, and that's millimeters cubed. Our delta P there was given as 20 megapascals and one megapascal, so 20 minus one, right, times 10 to the six, because it's mega, megapascals, and that's newtons per meter squared, over 0 0.018 kilogram per meter second and 15 millimeters is our L distance. All of that given. Okay, so I'm gonna actually do the unit check here because that was another weakness I've seen in the past. I wanna make sure it's very clear. Um, I'm gonna start by doing the Newton one here. So Newton is a kilogram meters per second squared. So let me just throw that in here. So we can have a complete cancellation here. So this millimeters cancels with this millimeters. Right, we've got a kilogram on the top and bottom that can cancel. This meter cancels with this one, and then we're just left with this meter on the bottom canceling this one. This seconds canceling with one of these seconds here, so we're left with millimeters cubed per second, and that is a volumetric flow rate, and it's totally good to go. So we go in and plug all that in, and we are left with 57.6 cubic millimeters a second. Okay, so that's pretty awesome, right? We can calculate our leakage flow rate. We still got a little more work to do. We're gonna box that out so nobody's confused. That's the answer we're looking for. But remember I said we gotta check. We have to make sure our approximations were valid, right? So the Reynolds number is really a thing we need to check. I'll scroll down here and just do that substitution. First thing we're gonna need is average velocity because we can't calculate Reynolds number without that. That's just our volumetric flow rate over our area which is Q over L times A, and in this case, it's pi D. A is our distance, so we sub in the 57.6 millimeters cubed per second. Super important if we're gonna use units like this to keep them and then cancel them off, right? 25 millimeters was our diameter, 0 0.005 millimeters is our gap distance. Make sure we're cool with that cancellation, millimeters, millimeters, so we're left with one on the top. So when we convert that to meters, it's actually 0.147 if we convert that unit to meters per second. Okay, so we get an idea. 0.147 meters per second is pretty slow. But let's just see what the Reynolds number is. Rho V A over our mu equals, we can look this up, 920 kilograms per meter cube, roughly for that oil. We just figured out 0.147 meters per second is our average velocity, gap length, 005 millimeters, right? And then we'll do this one meter is a thousand millimeters. I probably should have done the same conversion here just to make it really clear. To make sure we have our units matching there and then I need viscosity on the bottom which we got from the table 0 0.018. That's kilograms per meter second. That's a bit squirrely so let's check our units again. Kilograms and kilograms cancel. Millimeters, millimeters cancel. So that's meters squared on the top, leaving me one meter on the bottom. That cancels, that cancels. Seconds cancel. All right, so that's dimensionless as we would expect. What does that work out to? That works out to 0 0.0375. Okay, so we needed to be less than about 1,400. We are way, way, way less than 1,400, so it's totally fine. All the approximations we made are totally valid, right? That's a very... Very, very low Reynolds number flow. Awesome. 
Okay, highlights the practical value of this, right? How we go ahead and take those equations we derived, remembering that now that we've done this, so we, we have the analytical solution, I just showed you how to solve it. That means we don't have to do that analytical solution every single time. We can just use these equations now, all the laminar ones we saw in video 16. And so that solution reminds us though of when this is valid. Okay, and that's all for example 6.1.